Okay, so uh, thank you, Ben, uh, Paolo, and, uh, and Sergio for the invitation. This feels a little bit like home. Lots of faces, known faces, people I work with. Um, uh, there, there are two issues here for me. One, of course, is that I'm the last hurdle between you and lunch, and uh, this is, is, is bad, really bad. And the second one is that I'm feeling very unsophisticated because I'm still talking about transparency and open data, and, and uh, most of you guys uh, not even mentioned transparency uh, or access to information, and maybe Elian just, you touched on it very briefly, saying, yeah, the, those open data guys, it's, it's kind of over. I kind of agree with that. But uh, since there are so many techies here, I understand. Tell me if you can date this. Who first wrote this, said this? Give me a year, like a century or something. <laughs> Millennium. <laughs> OK, this goes back 250 years. So. Um, this comes from my research from, uh, from uh, the book uh, we have out, together with Ernesto Belisario, uh, Silenzi di Stato, um, State Silences. And uh, it, it comforts my, my idea that uh, it's not the technology that matters, but it's the social structures we, we build upon them. And uh, this is a marvelous social structure. This is the first FOIA law in the world. It's 250 years old. It's 14 uh, um, paragraphs, 14 articles, very clear. Uh, that sentence is from Article 10. And Article 10 is really all we needed. And like all the other stuff, the American FOIA, which is, uh, has its 15th birthday, uh, the uh, last 4th of July, and our law in Italy, I mean, all they needed is, is really the stuff that was in there. Freedom of information laws are, are something that are not new. Uh, they, they give a lot of power to citizens. You can do pretty mundane things, like accessing uh, um, health inspection records on restaurants in some countries. Like in the UK, you have this uh, marvelous application before going out to a restaurant or before ordering from uh, Foodora or whatever app you use, you can check uh, the rates, uh, the inspections from uh, uh, the, the kitchen you're ordering from. You can't do this in Italy yet. We'll see in a few months. In the States, you, can, you have things like this. So you can actually see who Barack, how many people have uh, met with Barack, with Barry, how many people with uh, Michelle, and who's on the top, who's, uh, who's having more meetings. And uh, actually, it's interesting because you can actually see who they are meeting. Who is meeting Barack Obama and Anna Burger? Actually, is uh, uh, a person involved in the unions. And uh, uh, Robert Wolf is uh, somebody who's uh, been on the economic uh, board, uh, consulting with Obama, and uh, uh, very coming from the financial world. So this is pretty relevant stuff. I mean, these are facts, and they they're relevant to our life, to our information. With the American FOIA, not with the Italian FOIA, a great deal of work has been done on this story. If uh, you're a bit old school and ha you have a bit of gray here, you might remember this. This is the DC-9 Itavia shot down over Rustica. And uh, still not clear who has shot it down. But uh, a colleague from Sole 24 Ore, Claudio Gatti, did a marvelous investigation. In, uh, you find it all in his book. It's great work, great journalistic work. Took him about 10 years. Uh, the book is uh, Il Quinto Scenario, the fifth, scenery, the fifth scenario. And uh, he, he accessed uh, records from uh, USS Saratoga, the Pentagon, hunted down uh, admirals. Uh, I mean, really marvelous work that shows you how effective, uh, how important the freedom of information and access to information is. Uh, he never was able, for some reason, to access uh, uh, data from the Italian government. I mean, this is like, you know, I, what, he didn't even bother to ask because it's, it was like non sequitur all the time. So how does this fare in Italy? Uh, actually pretty bad. Uh, this is from 2013. 
Uh, it's from the first um, monitoring study we did uh, together with actually with Antonella Napolitano who is sitting here and some other guys. Uh, and uh, we just asked, uh, I mean, there's an international protocol for doing this stuff. Uh, we asked a bunch of questions, about 360 questions, uh, access requests using the, uh, the only law that the Italy had at the time, which um, is very strict, that I've been using it a lot and uh, uh, paying direly for using it sometimes. Uh, so we don't, we don't get many answers in Italy. Italy, in fact, uh, till today scores uh, in, at the lowest uh, uh, parts of the uh, RTI rating, so that's the international as you probably know, the CPI for transparency and corruption, this is uh, the equivalent for access to information. So we're in the bottom 10, and we're doing pretty badly. Uh, the new law, we're trying to get a rating on the law, uh, and the new law should push us up, hopefully, at least 20 points, which is not much, but at least. This is something done on the law. as. Uh, all of you know, I mean, any of you who has tried an access request, but any citizen knows, it's not only the written law, but it's the practice law that matters. And uh, so our monitoring actually looked at uh, how administrations behaved in, in the real world. And it was quite demoralizing because uh, in 70, uh, like three times out of four, you wouldn't get what you wanted. That meant you either had, uh, this is still the 100%, so 65% was something, was we called it the Italian privilege. Uh, and we had to explain this to some, uh, um, to our international friends, especially the British, they wouldn't understand what uh, uh, administrative silence meant because uh, said, what do you mean they, they just don't answer? I was like, yeah, it's in the law. It's called silencio di niego. It's like, uh, it's not, uh, I don't answer so you can do it. It's, I don't answer so you don't get anything. And this is horrible. I mean, the, the, the British were appalled totally because they were like, this is like totally sterilizing any interest in participating from the citizens. And for, for journalists, it's, it's a killer thing because it makes you lose time it leaves you there for like a month, like crossing your fingers. Uh, if you're smart, you haven't told your editor-in-chief because uh, you don't want to raise expectations. And uh, maybe after a month and after you put in all that work for researching the stuff you want, you want to have, you just don't get anything. And if you want to actually appeal to that de silent denial, uh, you have to go to court, and you don't know why you're going to court. To court, I actually did that. It, it's, um, it was pretty bad. Uh, things you cannot know in Italy. Any of you know about this story? Uh, so, yeah, you, you cannot answer this. You know, of course, you should know. <laughs> But uh, okay, for our foreign friends who are not familiar with the uh, with Italian art, this is a form of Italian art. There's Venus inside that box. In fact, there is this Venus, which is uh, actually a very important piece of art. Uh, it's uh, uh, it's in Rome, but it was boxed up because we had the vis a state visit from uh, the Iranian Prime Minister. Uh, I won't comment on the idea of boxing it up, but I will tell you that uh, today uh, it's, not, it's been not been possible to know who has boxed it up. They have actually fired one of the um, uh, administrators involved uh, with this procedure, but uh, she has denied be signing anything. There is no document sh showing that uh, she actually ordered to do this. So, at present, we still do not know who boxed up Venus. This is, you do get to know some stuff. This is a work we did with uh, Massimo when he was at Wired. And it's, um, we tried to reconstruct the donations to political parties uh, over 20 more years. Uh, it's very partial. And 
uh, we did publish it with a lot of disclaimers saying, uh, look, this is the best we can do. This is, to date, is the best stuff, the best picture of uh, uh, what you can get in Italy. And it uh, leaves out, of course, a lot of uh, all the under the table stuff. And um, uh, it's very complicated to handle because they only give you PDF forms. They won't give you uh, machine processable data. Uh, and actually, when you ask for this data, they check on you. You have to um, send your ID, and they ask you, why do you actually you, you actually want this? I mean, what are you doing? It's like, you know, I'm a reporter, you know, this is relevant data. It's kind of our money, or it goes to our politicians. And, I mean, it's not our money, but it's, it, tells actually you, it tells you actually a lot about um, how uh, political parties functions, it, it's a tiny fraction of uh, what political parties get. The, the most important one is uh, the blue, because it's a private donations, and it shows you who they're getting money from. And uh, it was very funny because uh, um, some, uh, some companies were giving money to both parties. I mean, it's like the big companies running motorways, they just, you know, it's, they're very bipartisan. Uh, but it's it's very like aggregated, so it's um, you lose granularity, and the granularity uh, for any one of you who handles data, that's it's all about granularity. You know this this guy, former mayor of Rome. Uh, he's the only guy, he's the only mayor in Italy to date who has actually put his uh, expenses in open data. Uh, he was kind of forced to do it because uh, uh, they were bringing him to court over it. Uh, but uh, we have a whole chapter in the book about this. If you try and ask with the current uh, access to information laws, if you try and ask all the other mayors in Italy uh, for their detailed expenses, you just get lump sums. And it, uh, this was a colleague from uh, Il Fatto Quotidiano who did it. And um, basically, uh, the PRs will tell you, oh, you want to know how much that visit in Austria to London costed? Well, uh, go look up the day he, he went to London and, uh, and see if there's a press release and then ask us the detailed questions. And then they give you, you know, another lump sum where, where there's the travel and the accommodation. And then you have to ask more and more. At, it's, it's a process that is never ending. And of course, you never get down to the bottom of the actual figure. Uh, we're nowhere near to what we've seen in the UK or in Ireland where uh, ministers have been forced to, um, to resign. Uh, actually, over small sums of money because people don't get mad about how much money, I mean, a, a lot of money. There's been a case recently in the Italian news about the deputy chair of the, um, uh, of the Camera of, the, um, of Congress uh, spending, what, uh, 100,000 euro over three years. Is that a lot of money? I don't know. The point is, what, is it justified, right? In Ireland, I was talking to an, uh, an Irish colleague uh, who's kind of a foyer terrorist over there. And uh, they pulled out, they showed that uh, their Ministry uh, for Culture spent uh, like uh, uh, 429 euros on a haircut. People got so pissed with that, that he had to resign. And that was, I mean, it wasn't a lot of money in absolute terms, but for a haircut, it was a huge amount of money. The guy, the guy saw the picture, by the way, had not much hair on his head. So the per hair uh, count of euros was enormous, of course. But people relate to uh, things they know, they can measure. And of course, they get mad about it. Sometimes we do get stuff. This was an excellent work from two friends uh, um, in Genoa, and they showed where the slot machines are. Uh, this is, uh, well, there's a law in, uh, in Liguria in Genoa saying that, uh, stating that um, you shouldn't have a slot machine within 400 meters uh, from a school. And of course, it's there it says in, in a certain part of Genoa, which is the blue collar most part of Genoa, you have a slot machine every 235 meters. 
So there's something that's not right there. So this shows you that when you do get that data, it is actually very important. It was uh, Alessio Cimarelli and uh, Raffaele Mastronardo who this, this uh, I find excellent. It was first page on the local paper, Secolo uh, XIX. This is another story. Uh, this is a story I should uh, really pay tribute to uh, Elisabetta Tola for, for bringing my attention on this. We did a lot of reporting uh, at Wired and uh, uh, ever since I've been following it. It's, uh, well, Italy is a highly seismic country. Uh, half of our territory is uh, uh, risk one, risk two areas, and we have about 44, 45,000 uh, school buildings. About half of those are in high risk area. Uh, this is the last building that collapsed. I think it's the last because there was an earthquake, but correct it. This is still the last. Okay, it was on 24th of August. And uh, uh, I was commenting with Elisabetta when we saw this, like, this is what we've seen. Because when we did our investigation, it was 2012, we were asking for the uh, list of, uh, of school buildings with their safety checks. We never got to it. To pre at today, I don't think there is that document. That database, if it exists, it has never been accessed. This picture shows you how important it would be to access those, uh, that information. I mean, this is something you see regularly in Italy. In fact, there was, there has been, there had been uh, um, work done on the school building to um, improve its resistance, but it was still sub. Uh, uh, was it, I don't know the the exact term, but basically they they improved it, but it, they didn't make it earthquake safe. So the irony is, uh, the actually. The state actually spent money, the community actually spent money in that school, but uh, uh, nobody checked uh, to see if they were spending it to make it really safe. So they basically wasted their money because this is uh, the effect of a 5.9 sixth grade earthquake, which in, like in Japan, it hardly uh, shakes, some, uh, uh, shakes the leaves off uh, uh, trees and buildings. So this is another work we did recently. Um, okay, for our non-Italian friends, uh, uh, amianto is asbestos. Uh, so these are about 40,000 uh, contamination points for asbestos. Asbestos in Italy is a very, very big thing. In Trieste, of course, you know this because you had uh, uh, the ship industry, the shipyards, and they were using lots of that. But basically, Italy is built on asbestos. We have been the uh, first producer of asbestos uh, uh, in the Western world up to the 1990s and uh, the second consumer after the Soviet Union. Uh, it peaked in 1976 and then it sort of went down until 1992 when it was made illegal. Still, our buildings, uh, our uh, industries, um, a lot of abandoned uh, um, uh, lands uh, are still contaminated. Uh, and this is a very partial view. Uh, you probably heard of Eternit. Uh, and of course, the Italians have, but uh, the non-Italians have probably heard of Eternit. That's the biggest trial for asbestos-related uh, death in Europe, probably in the world. Uh, Casale Monferrato is actually up there. It's like here, in this uh, black patch, a bit south of Turin. And... Uh, so the, the astonishing thing here is that you have no asbestos in Piemonte. When, uh, when, I mean, this is data that comes from the Ministry of Environment. So we actually asked them because uh, the first thing they, we got from them, I mean, it's, it wasn't totally voluntary disclosure, but it, let's say we got this data. Um, and uh, we asked them, well, what's going on? I mean, you couldn't see it from the, uh, the Excel spreadsheet, but once you mapped it, it was like, uh, you guys are missing something here. Uh, Sicily and, and Calabria, it, it was kind of, kind of new because uh, they hardly started their mapping, but Piemonte, I mean, Casale, 
everybody knows that there is asbestos there. Uh, and they were like, oh, we don't have that data. We can't, but how did you do, no, the first answer was like, how did you guys do this? It's like, <laughs> never mind, we did it. Tell us if it's wrong or if it's correct. So they never said it was wrong. Uh, when the regional council in Piemonte saw this, they got so mad. There was um, uh, an open interrogation, and the, the guy in charge of uh, transparency for the regional environment agency uh, got sacked. Uh, and in fact, uh, Piemonte did publish their own separate map, which is actually very good. Uh, and uh, it's so good that it doesn't integrate with our data, so we were never able to share to our readers uh, a full Italian map. But uh, to give you an idea of how relevant this data is, asbestos, uh, uh, asbestos caused mesoteliomas, that's uh, a cancer from uh, the, the lung membrane, uh, caused about uh, 3,000 de deaths per year in Italy, that's uh, eight deaths uh, per, per day, and uh, the count is growing because, of course, the, the agent is still there. So it's not something that you've been exposed to uh, before 1992, and then it's gone away. It's actually getting worse because it's still there and it's not protected. You have buildings that are collapsing. Earthquakes are part of this. Uh, the crisis is part of this, so things are not being maintained and people get exposed to asbestos pow in powder very often. Uh, I've, uh, I've, I've done a, a couple of stories on people that were not working in industries like shipyards or train restructure manufacturing, but like in banks. Uh, and uh, so the last thing you would imagine would be being exposed to asbestos. And they actually, uh, they actually didn't know they had asbestos, so it's very relevant. This shows you the mesoteliomas. And, uh, my time is coming to an end here, so I'm, uh, I'll be rushing a bit. This shows you, this is actually uh, a case I brought up. I went to court over access to um, uh, state swap contracts, and I lost. I lost twice. The first time I, uh, was very bad because actually they fined me with a thousand euro for asking. So I asked the Ministry of Finance. Uh, it was, of course, uh, a administrative silence, so they, they didn't answer. They said it wasn't silent denial because they lost the, the mail I sent them for requesting it. So they said, I'm, we're very sorry, but we didn't just get your mail. We, we protocoled it, but then it got lost, so we didn't answer you, so I had to... Uh, appeal in the blind, basically, and uh, I lost, and they fined me with a thousand euro. Uh, last uh, August, uh, I went to, we appealed again to the uh, state court, the highest administrative court in Italy, the Consiglio di Stato, and the Consiglio di Stato um, lifted the, the fine, so that was good. I'm a thousand euros richer now. But um, they said something very, very bad for journalists because, and for the public interest because they said uh, I, I was advocating access to this information, saying that as a journalist I represent the public interest and so um, I should be entitled to see these contracts. And they said, well, uh, your investigation is very good. Uh, that's very good journalistic work. But uh, your, your right as a journalist, your interest as a journalist, is not strong enough to represent the public interest. And that's like, so what are we doing as journalists? I mean, <laughs> what's our point in that actually existing? So this was a campaign uh, we, um, Benny was talking about. Um, this started uh, actually in... 2014, as an idea, uh, the Italian says here, we want a Freedom of Information Act. And it was a petition we started because Matteo Renzi actually mentioned it in his uh, um, induction speech uh, uh, on the 24th of February 2014. And we said, well, maybe we have a window of opportunity here. Let's go for it. Uh, so we got together uh, 32 civil society organizations, we petitioned online, and to make a brief story short, we wrote up a text that was 
uh, on the blueprint of the American FOIA, so as progressive as possible for Italy. That text was actually pushed into Parliament, and that's where it still sits. It, it hasn't become the actual law, which was passed last May. Uh, the good news is we do have a law now, and it will be effective December 23rd. So if you don't know what to do for Christmas, just you can sit there and write up your FOIA request. Um, actually, you will have to wait a little bit to, to write, uh, to know how to write it, because uh, the anti-corruption agency in Italy is currently, is presently working on the guidelines for the exceptions. And FOIA laws are just as good as their exceptions, meaning that uh, if the exceptions are very broad and generic and imprecise, again, it's not uh, administrative silence, but it gets close to it. Um, at present, we have an exception saying uh, um, we can dismiss uh, all requests uh, um, that can uh, uh, damage uh, uh, economic or commercial interests of uh, uh, private citizens or uh, companies. And, I mean, phrased like that, it's kind of like anything. So, uh, this has to be interpreted. We are advocating as a, a civil society movement for uh, a public interest. What they call in, in the UK, they call it a, a public interest test. So, if there's nothing against the disclosure, it should be disclosed. Disclosure should be the default option. So, um, last advice here. Uh, I'm over time, big time over time here. So, uh, I, what I should mention is use it or lose it. Uh, write, you can write up your request, send it by mail, hand it in, or uh, do it over the phone. But there are platforms. Uh, one of the platforms, I mean, the most popular ones go back to my society. There are, like, in any language for many countries. In Italy, you have Chiedi, which is uh, uh, working on the same open source software. And uh, you should buy this book. <laughs> That's <laughs> just to say it straight out. Uh, I know hypoglycemia is just coming in. But if you do have questions, I'm, I'm very willing to answer. Or if you want to just get in touch during lunch, after lunch, I'm here.